There we go. Now it's being recorded. So it's going to go on internet later on, on, on YouTube. I do not edit anything. Don't have time for that. I just record it and dump it over YouTube. So if I ever use any F words, by F I mean fuzzy, okay? Uh, if I use any kind of words and stuff like that, I apologize. It's not a filtered thing and I'm not doing this for any purpose other than students to be able to go review the things. Like that little thing that Fardad said, I went to the washroom, I didn't hear, come back in, or I didn't understand it, you just repeat it and you, you can see what's going on. So the video of the lecture is up here, the notes are on GitHub, everything's in your hand to review whatever you want to do. All right? Um, again, not a guarantee. Things go wrong, things don't get recorded, there's a problem somewhere, it happens. The quality is not good, many things happen. Careful, okay? Don't rely on this. It's just a plus if it's there, okay? So if I want to create a new project on Visual Studio 2019, either I start from right here or I can go continue without code. It doesn't make any difference. Potatoes, potatoes, but creating a new project by choosing file, new project, it's the exact same thing. So I click on that one. Because I'm only using C Sharp and C++, these are the things that I have. When you open it over there, you're going to see all the language known to man over there. So you have to dig for it and try to find these out. These keywords that you see over here are important things to look at. Let me see if I can, does it make, get bigger? No. In here it says C Sharp, Android, iOS, Linux, Mac OS, Unit, Windows Library, which means that's the project I want to create. I don't want that. So I want empty project. That's the first thing that you have to look for. Empty project, C++, Windows, console, that's what I want. Okay? C++, Windows, console, that's what I want, all right? If you do console app, it creates a console app for you, and then it creates a Hello World program in it. You don't need to, you know how to do Hello World. If you don't know how to do Hello World, you're in big trouble, okay? But anyways, so empty project is what we do. So what I'm going to do is click on that one. Next, next thing you need to do Make sure this little thing over here is always, always, always checked. Why? Because Visual Studio is an integrated development environment created to write ginormous applications. Let's say you want to create an e-commerce project product for a company. They need an inventory program that keeps track of their inventory. They need to have a POS program, point of sale, to run their cashiers and do the stuff and then tell to the inventory program how many things are needed and yada, yada, yada. They need a, an online sale shopping cart program that is a web application that is supposed. So they are, have, they are having several different projects that they want to keep it in somewhere. That's creating several projects in a solution. That's when you need this thing unchecked. When you have five projects in one place, we are writing a for loop to print five numbers. I don't want five projects. It's just one little cutesy thingy project that I want to work with. So that's what we're going to do. So it's not going to create a nested directory for no reason. I love to see students are obsessed with these details. Don't, in a degree, computer programming needs a little bit of obsessive compulsive disorder thingy in you, which means you have to be obsessed by having that indentation always three. You have to be obsessed to always have that curly bracket at the end of the function if that's your style. It, you have to be upset, obsessed by having the name of something capitalized. Whatever that, you, like things that you are doing, stick to it because it's very important to be consistent, okay? So because, oh, I just do this and it's going to do it anyway. Who cares if I have another directory? In a, you're not a programmer anymore. Okay? You have to be strict and obsessive on the things that you're doing. Okay? Because that's what programming is. If you're not obsessed with that little dot, the whole program is going to fall apart. So you have to be obsessed. You have to learn to be obsessed. Sorry, bad word for it, but hey. Anyways, I click next. No, I'm not going to click next. I'm going to select where I wanted to create it. So I'm going to click over here, browse. I want to create it inside the repository, the clone that the repository that I cloned from GitHub in here, so I can push it up into GitHub later. So my location is set. For you in school, probably it's desktop. 
or there, I think you have a drive called T. Can, can anybody look at it? Is there a drive T over there? And you can look at your Windows Explorer. Don't worry, it's not going to bite you. That's Windows Explorer. Oh, D, temp. OK, so you have a drive D. So there is an extra drive they create for you if you want to dump your stuff that gets wiped out. So another thing that you need to remember, either hard reboot your computer or delete all those stuff before you leave. Extremely important. Why? Because if you leave your stuff, somebody else comes, picks it up, uses your assignment, you are hooked for it for cheating too. You didn't even notice what you are. Careful. That's the rule. Okay? It's not something that I came up with. That's how it is. Uh, keep your uh, information. If it's an open thing that you're doing, that's fine. Leave it there. But if it's something, an assignment, a project, something that only belongs to you, keep it over there. We're going to go through all these things soon. Okay? So the next thing I want to do, I select a folder. Now I'm going to create the project name. Okay? So because I'm doing it based on the sessions, I'm going to call put the 02. This is the second one for today. It's September 3rd, and it's for section C. That's how I name these things. Okay? So as you see every single note that I write, so you can actually go and check other classes' notes to see what I have done over there. All right? And that's it. Then I'm going to say create, and three years later, it's going to create my Visual Studio um, project. Now, when you are installing Visual Studio 2019, and you should on your computers at home, for all those people who have Macs and Linuxes, okay? Uh, I'm a Linux guy myself. My computer at home is a Linux, okay? But because the school is teaching Visual Studio using to you, using, teaching you how to use Visual Studio, you need to have that, okay? I know you have Xcode on your Mac, and I know Xcode is the best integrated development environment that created in whole world, and Apple is the best product in the world. I know, but you have to use this, okay? Learn how to create a virtual machine on your Mac. If you don't know, download VMware. VMware Workstation, it's free, you can download it. It becomes a computer. So you literally say, I want a computer, I want to have two CPUs, and I want to have this much RAM. And then you install, you get Windows 10 uh, operating system from school. It's free for you. Install it. Have Windows install Visual Studio 2019 and work on that. If you are using any other thing, help is going to be limited. I don't know what Xcode is. Apple products against my religion. I don't like them. OK? And that's why I'm teaching this. OK, if you want to do work on Linux, Eclipse, stuff like that, I can help you. But for that, I shouldn't, because I'm going out of standard. Why do you need Visual Studio? It's not that I like the thing. First of all, I like it because it's very visual. It's good for teaching, OK? And like any other integrated development environment, it's awesome. Xcode is amazing when you work with it. So is this one. So is Eclipse. So is CodeLight. So is any other thing that we have out there. So I don't want to hold sides. But you're going to need this for OOP 24, IPC, OOP 244, 345, game programming, system design, web programming. You're going to need to learn to work with this. So when do you want to learn it? When you are in sixth semester and you are doing game programming and the topic is so difficult that you don't have time for anything else? Or when you are doing kindergarten stuff? OP244 IPC. So this is the time to learn this. Please learn it. If you have used something else in IPC, switch. OK? On Linux, same thing. VMware, remember that. Let me write these things, because what I'm going to do, again, as I mentioned, I'm going to put all these things uh, in an announcement and send it to everyone. And because in each class, I'm saying something differently that based on uh, the interaction that we are going to do, I'm going to get all the stuff, put it together, it's going to be an announcement on Blackboard and emailed to you. So it's in the announcement and Blackboard. So VMware is another thing. I'm going to take a picture of the thing before I go, the board, so I know what I'm writing. All right. So smoking or non-smoking? I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, if you see a computer beside you, please turn it on. Whenever you are coming to lab, if you see there is a computer beside you, turn them on, okay? 
let them be on, shake the mouse, wake them up, make sure they're on because it's not only helping your friends when they are coming in. It doesn't go on, so turn it off. <laughs> so it, it not only helps that, but also if something goes wrong with your computer, you can quickly switch to another one. Okay? So please do so. Did you turn them off? Thank you. All right. So yeah. Um, that's that. So VMware, install it. Install Windows. And uh, do that. You don't need to install the whole thing. Just install Windows and Visual Studio. You're done. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> all the... Oh! Um, I don't only put these things on, on, on YouTube. I do lots of... Uh, um, kind of a how-to uh, videos on YouTube. So if you go to this uh, repository, you come to read me, it tells you what is the outline, timeline, Einlon version of the area, uh, workshops. Not only that, uh, bottom over here says, uh, that's coding style, we're going to come to all those things. Videos, see how to, how to play this. If you click over here, it takes you to a YouTube list, list Git installation on Windows 10, Tortoise Git installation. Uh, uh, Creating GitHub account, GitHub student development. I'm, I'm going to talk about every, every single one of these things today, okay? So it tells you how to do all those things, okay? By the way, our school is not SICT anymore. It's changed. SDDS, that's what we are. SDDS, you are in a school called SDDS. It stands for Software Design and Database, no. Uh, I don't know. I'll, when I send you an email, you're going to see it in my signature, okay? Oh, well, we're new. I don't know. Uh, sorry about that. But anyways. Uh, so, yeah. We said what is Git. So, Git is essentially a database for code, which keeps track of all the changes that you can do stuff. Git is a distributed program, distributed program. What does it mean? It means it can distribute itself everywhere. So you can have a Git repository on one computer, you can clone it to another computer, another computer, another computer, and you can sync them together. Not only that, you can have one repository, two people can clone it, do their work separately, then push the changes to a master repository and merge their code together. So 2, 10, 50, 500 people can work at the same time on the same project merging their codes together. The person who sits up there and receives all these codes and merges the code together is called a submitter or a committer, okay? So a committer pro person is a person who has the rights to commit. So you want to push it up, you send what is called a pull request. You're essentially saying, I want you to pull my changes into the repository. If they want to, they'll do it. We're not going to do it today. We're not going to do it ever in the semester, so don't worry about it, okay? I'm just letting you know because I want you to Install Git on Windows 10. You must do that. Install Tortoise Git on Windows 10. You must do that. You must create a GitHub account with your Seneca ID. How many people have a Git account, GitHub account here today? Okay. If you did not use your Seneca email, you can go into Settings. Just click on Settings and go to Emails, add your email, Seneca email, change the primary to that. Don't worry, you can always change, you when you change that when you graduate. The good thing is that using that, you can get the GitHub Student Developer Package, which is essentially lots of goodies that you have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars if you want to actually buy them. And as a student, it's all free for you. As soon as you log in with your student ID over there, it recognizes that you are from Seneca College, and they're all free for you. Okay? Do that. I'm showing you how it's basic commands using Tortoise Git, how to create a, a repository. Like, people are creating still memory sticks. Come on. Well, that's, what is this, 1994? Like, you have, now you have to have a repository on Git. Anything you do, and now Git is offering unlimited private repositories to everyone. It used it before when Microsoft wasn't the, the owner. Microsoft bought this. Before that, it was only open source that was unlimited. For others, you had to pay. But now, everything is free. So you can actually create private repositories, and then you can push your work to it, come to school, pull it, and continue your work, and then push home, go back, do it. Or a group work project. Create a project, invite five people to that project, to that repository, so five people have access to that repository without anybody else seeing. 
careful. If you create a repository and it's public and you put your student work in it, you are hooked if somebody copies it. Remember that. Are we okay? I've been told that I talk too fast. If I do, please slow me down so I can speak in a normal rate. Okay? Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Okay, so are we okay with this? Down to here? Any problem? One? Pardon me? Tor tortoise. Tortoise. Tortoise Git is essentially a, a GUI interface for Git. All the stuff that you do in Git, they are command line. Git is not, Git is, Git is for geeks, which means you essentially, if you want to pull something, you have to say Git pull, put the repository thing. All this stuff are command line, okay? They created a GUI interface to be able to interact with Git without writing command lines. I recommend that to students because without getting involved to the, with the details of the command, you get involved and learn how, what things are in Git. And after you are familiarized with it, you know what does it mean repository, you know what does it mean pull, you know what does it mean merge, you know what does it mean push, you know what does it mean pull request. When you understand all these things, then you're going to go learn the command line. So it's much easier for students to learn. <clears throat> Tortoise Git to Git is like Visual Studio to C++. You can write C++ with Notepad, correct? But you use it, you use Visual Studio Y because it has debugging capabilities, it has syntax highlighting, it gives you some, uh, yeah, all right? So that's it, okay? Thank you for the question, I like that. Yes, madam. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, we always work on the latest version. Uninstall it and install 2019. It's a free thing you have it, my dear. Install it. They gave you something free. Use it. Use your money. You paid for it. Use it. I know. I, it's not that how I feel. Quite frankly, I can teach this with Visual Studio 2011 for all I care. We are not learning anything very... Actually, 11, can I? Uh, there's maybe at the end of the semester we had to switch to 17, but 17 is very updated and okay for us. Uh, but because we always want to use the latest tools, that's what we are doing. So it's a kind of, actually, uh, 2019 is easier than 17 to create stuff. Trust me, and uh, I, I tried it. You can try it too. All right, so yeah, Tortoise get you installed, develop a package you get, and then the basic commands, and then at the end, I am showing you actually how to install Visual Studio 2019 community version, creating a console app, and pushing it into GitHub, how to do all these things. So those are all there. Then I'm going to create, like this is 15 minutes, I'm gonna, and this is 16 minutes. I'm going to break these part to smaller videos, only focusing how to push something to Git, and then focusing how to pull something from Git, how to fix conflicts and things like that. We'll, 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 we'll come to it soon. Um, are we okay down to here? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Sold. Okay, so we're going to go for the next step. Let me see what we have in here. Sorry, it's lots of talking today, but don't worry. I'm going to soon uh, work on all the good stuff that we have. What you see in this document, which says OP244, NAB, and NC in class notes and material, always supersedes and overrides whatever you see anywhere else in the documentation of the work that you see. So if you have a workshop and in that workshop tells you how to reflect on your quizzes, this overrides that, okay? So read this and see what does it say. If in the workshop you see it tells you how to reflect on your quizzes, that's not how I want it. This is how I want it. This is my document. Please take a look at it, and any topic that you see it's in here, do it that way, not the ones that is for everyone at Seneca, okay? And that's reality of life. Tomorrow you're going to go work for a place, and you're going to have a manager, and that manager is going to tell you, or a project manager is going to tell you, I want things to be done this way and this way and this way. You work for five years, you go somewhere else, completely different. You have to learn how to cope. 
You have to learn and see how your boss wants things to be done. I don't want to call myself boss, but that's the reality. I'm your boss now. Okay? Therefore, you have to see how you should do your work to please me. It's not that I want to be the king of things. That's not the case. It's the reality of things. When I want to manage 100 students, if each student does the thing in its own way, I'll be doomed. I won't be able to mark one single thing or reflect on anything or give you feedback on anything. I have to be so much organized and everything has to be so much serialized so I can go from student to student like that. If you just do your own stuff and you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say your own stuff. I ask you, for example, you do your test. I ask you, please put the questions inside your test and give it to me. And you don't. And you don't know that causes how much craziness when I'm actually marking things. Very simple stuff that looks very easy. Or you ripped everything about, apart and put all the things in uh, bad order. So first page 10, then first page 2, and you just go, he's going to do it. Who cares? He's going to mark. Remember, you make me suffer, I make you suffer. Okay? If I see you have written everything nicely, perfectly, it's not that I'm a bad person. That's human nature. If I see something nice, I'll be nice at that moment. If somebody pisses me off, then I'll be angry. Then I'll do irrational things. It's not that I will do it. Any human being will do it. Be aware of it. Okay? For those who just came in, please start these things on your My App. Tortoise Git, Potty, and Visual Studio 2019. How to do quizzes. We're going to have quizzes. When? Every single day that you're coming in. Which essentially, I don't know. Quiz is the only thing that I do not announce. Anytime that I see I had time to design a quiz, that's when you're going to do it. We're going to have up to 26 quizzes or only 7. 26 because we have 13 weeks and we have 2 sessions per week. So actually it's 25 because we didn't do it today. Okay, so it could be every day. It could be every, two, every other week. It could be twice a week. I don't know. So every time that I feel the need for it, you're going to do a quiz. And uh, if the quiz is supposed to be on the material that I did not teach yet, so I'm going to say, I want you to read this thing before you come to class. Then I'm going to tell you there's going to be a quiz on that. So if I want you to read something, and then I'll come and teach you because it's complicated, I want you to be ready for it, then I'll get a quiz for it. Okay? And I lie a lot too. I'm going to say you have a quiz but I'm not going to give you a quiz, just to make sure that you study, okay? You can gamble, but I strongly suggest that you won't, because the right that the day that I say, today I'm not going to read it because, study it because far that never takes away, that day I'll do it, okay? So remember, okay. How the quizzes work? We have, uh, no matter what, how big or small is the question in the quiz, each question in the quiz has two marks. That's universal in my quizzes. All my quizzes are like this. Each quiz question has two marks. If you answer it perfectly, you get two. Or close to perfect. Answer somewhat correctly. Let's put it that way. Okay, you get two. If you try to answer, and I see you tried, but answer is wrong, you get one mark. If you're completely bananas, I ask you what is your name, and you told me I like coffee. Okay, something like that completely out of the thing, or you don't answer, you get zero. Now, there is hope. That's the reflection on quizzes that I, that I started over here. What I do is this. After I give your quizzes back, you look at your quizzes. You follow these steps, and you reflect on your quiz. How? You write the question that you had a mistake with. So you write the text of the question. You write what did you do that was wrong, and then you correct it. And I'll give you one mark back. Which means, if you got a mark, you got one mark, you get the full mark back. If you completely went wrong, you get 50% of the mark. So still, I'll give you something back for your effort. That forces you to see what your mistakes were. Okay? So, like that, we are okay even if you are doing quizzes on what we haven't taught. Because if you somehow answer, you get the mark. And then you find out what the answer, you give it, and you get the full mark. Be beautiful. Again, how to submit it? Till.far.solim and where is it? 
submit 244 underline Q question mark. The question mark is replaced with the quiz number. So quiz number one, two, three, and then underline F, or F, enter. I'll tell you how to create an alias for that long thingy. So instead of typing tilde for that dot Soleimani, you just do F submit, and it does that, OK? If you know how to create an alias, they told you, they told you, right, in ULI 101. Come on, do it for heaven's sake. Use your knowledge, OK? Just, just have, just have tilde for that dot Soleimani slash submit this phrase alias to f sub so you don't have to retype it over and over and over and over and over and over you are allowed to teach him uh, to to cheat in my class cheating is allowed as long as you told you tell me that you cheated which is essentially not cheating anymore it's research right all the period like you, you can write a scientific paper and the parts that you got from others, you simply write it and you say, this guy, professor, this, did that, this. So you cite people on their work, and that's very fine. You are not going to be credited for that because it's someone else's work, but still your paper is a paper and you're okay. So if you are stuck in a project and it's, and it's due two hours from now, and you know this function is not working, you can ask your friend, can I get the code for your function and put it right in here? You get that function, you put it, with every single workshop of mine, a file will have to be submitted. You will see when you try to submit, it won't let you submit it unless you have sources.txt over there. Okay? In sources.txt, either we write, I have done all the coding by myself, only copy that error professor provided, and you write your name and student number. That means you are signing that this work is mine and no one else's. Or you write, I, wrote, I took this part from John, this part from Jane, that part from Jill, and you write the parts that you have gotten from people and you give the credit to them. First, I will thank them for helping you. Secondly, you only lose mark for that part. So instead of 100%, you get 85. I think that's fair. Right? If you do not cite, it's considered cheating, OK? And it's going to go into your thing. And I know you have all done it in last semester. You copied the workshops from the other things. And I tell you why. I, I know that, OK? It is impossible for somebody to submit perfectly all the workshops and fail the final exam. There is no explanation for it. Imagine, you have done all the weekly workshops and you got 100% and every and each. And then you cannot write a for loop in the, in the exam? Is that possible? It's just 2 plus 2. I'm not doing any magic. I don't do mind reading, OK? That's why I changed the workshops. How the workshops are done are now like this. You have three sections of workshop. Reflection is gone, OK? Reflection is gone. You have an end lab. It is due to be submitted inside the lab physically. So I literally in enter the IP address of the classroom. And you cannot submit your in lab from anywhere else other than the lab. You have to come to lab. Or if you can't come, you have to tell me that I'm sick, I can't come. This is my IP number. And I will add your IP number to the submitter so you can get, so you can, so you can get whitelisted. Number one. And the lab, in lab that you are doing is not supposed to be done in the lab. It's supposed to be submitted in the lab. So as soon as we publish the lab, go check the in lab. Start doing it and bring your problems to lab. Okay? Don't let the teacher spoon feed you. Try to do it yourself. Come with your problems so your problems are fixed in the lab. And you do it and you submit it. Okay? Then, at home is just a little bit of spice, pepper, and you know what I mean? Things added to the in-lab, and you have two days to do it, the at-home one. Again, that is completely uh, spoon-fed. So we tell you, do this, create that function, do this in that function, do that, do that. There is a third part, because it's called DIY, do it yourself. That's usage of in-lab and at-home, 
a completely open-ended thing. I'm going to tell you, I want a program that does this. And this output has to get generated. Do it however you want. These are the files that your code should be in, and that's it. So you get the file names and what the program's supposed to do. Everything, you have to do it yourself. In-lab is 30% or 25. At home is 30% or 40. And in the, the do-it-yourself is either 30 or 40%. So as a result, if you just do your work in in-lab at, at home, you can get a maximum of 70%, which I think it's very fair to get a P B if you cannot do the thing yourself. OK? If you do the do-it-yourself by yourself, then you get 100%. And we are good. All right? Yeah. Everything is submitter. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that you don't miss a dot when you're submitter. I know you hate me for that. I wrote that. Blackboard or? I never do sub submitter on Blackboard. It's submitter, the program that I have written. So you essentially go submit. Have you, ever, have you taken IPC 144 yet? Night or day? Uh, edu uh, continuing education or in the morning? You submitted your work with, uh, uh, on Blackboard? No. Oh, so you were actually writing the name of the professor slice that that was my fault. Sorry, that's that's how you do it. Yeah. So so that's that. So so we're gonna do that. Uh, if you are a student with accommodation, you have to let me know that you want to use that, and I'm gonna add your name to the submitter. So automatically the submitter is gonna grant you the extension. Uh, you don't have to come to me for anything. So you just tell me, student with accommodation. Uh, if you have if you have, if you need more time, and it's documented that you need more time to do your stuff, I have, I already received your emails, uh, your letters of recommendation. I got that, but through through request of the students, we don't apply them unless they ask for it. So you may only say, I just want to use that for final exam. I just want to use that for my tests. We can't give it to you for quiz because it's in class. Two seconds, you got to come and do it. Maybe. I'm going to come on out to find another way to accommodate that, but that's the thing. Uh, but for uh, workshops and project, if you want to do that, you've got to ask me, OK? And I'm going to add it to the submitter, add your name to the submitter. So as soon as you check the due date, you know how to check the due date, right? You write submit, the name of the thing, dash due. And it tells you what the due date of the assignment is, exactly how much it's going to be. Okay. Uh, and the uh, due date is different. It's not like last semester that if you don't give the thing, it's gone, you, you, you lost everything. So for in-lab and at home, we'll give you by the end of the week, and I'm going to give you five more days to next week to complete your do-it-yourself for a penalty. So if, you're, if in that three days you, couldn't do, you didn't do that do-it-yourself and you did it in six days, you get 20% off. If you could do after four days, you get 50% off. Then if you do it after a week, it won't allow you to submit it. It, it, it will get rejected. OK? So that's that. Uh, I'm not a bad person on this. Trust me. This is a good thing. Uh, I want you to, to, to practice. I want you to program. I, as a prof, like I, rem I was teaching over here, 20, I'm teaching here 22 years now. Ten years ago, it wasn't like this. It's supposed to be reverse. People should be computer savvy now. You should be better programmers now. But it's not. People are getting past better. But when I look at your exams, that's like, this person shouldn't pass. And because you got 51% in, in, the, in the final exam, you pass with a B plus. Because all the workshops were all A. <laughs> OK, that doesn't make sense to me. It has to be balanced. So that's what we are doing. And I guarantee that it's not going to make any difference to the number of passes. It's not going to make any difference to the, number of, to, to the mark of the students. The only outcome is going to be that students will know how to program better. That's all. OK? Because many of you, you really study, but you study computers as you're studying geography. That doesn't work. Okay, you have to practice. It's like driving a car. You read 50 books on the driving car. If you have never driven a car, you're going to hit a tree. You have to practice. That's what it is. Okay, Visual Studio, we talked about it. Tabs, spaces in. 
uh, Visual Studio. OK. Anyone wants a break? Yes? OK. All right. So I'll pause this. All right. So the question was, the question was, uh, what if I come with my laptop and I would do my stuff on my laptop? Do it on your laptop, upload to Matrix, then go on your computer, open up the party, and submit it. So you can just do the final submission from the computer in the lab. Okay? I could add you, but the problem is that the Wi-Fi network shares one IP address. So if I give you access, then I'm going to give you address, access to anybody in total, the whole Seneca College that is connected to Wi-Fi. That's not going to work out. But that, again, if this, I don't know how this campus works. At Seneca, at York, every single lab has its own subnet mask. So therefore, I can do that. If this one doesn't, then I can't do that either. Then we'll, I'll come up with something else. I don't know. Secrets and things like that. All right. What was the last thing I was talking about? Anybody remembers? No? Ah, thank you. One mark for your first, uh, first uh, quiz. Oh, remind me of these things. I do this all the time, OK? I give you marks for, for good questions, for good answers that you give me. But I don't rem I rem if you remind me of it, I remember it, OK? So when the time comes, if I told you 2% for first test, remember that. Just come to me, say, Farhad, remember 2% for the test? Add it, and I'll add it. I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm adding one point because each quiz is like whatever it is. You've got to get one point. Yeah. So the first quiz. Uh, or you can keep it for the next quiz. It doesn't matter. All right. Tabs. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Much appreciated. OK, so add new items. So uh, oh, when you open up Visual Studio, there are 55,000 tabs coming up. OK? Um, now it's actually a good time to, to, to bring up your Visual Studio and, and t take a look at it. OK? Um, so um, just have it. Look at the solution. Uh, look at the, uh, um, the structure of it. I, and I want it to be ready when I tell you to do something. I want it to be up and running. So I'm going to add. You don't need to follow me yet, I told you. But I'm, I'm going to tell you when to do it. So I'm going to do a new item. And I'm going to create over here. Um, sorry, there's glue over here and the, and the thing in it. My mouse is. All right, I think it's better now. OK, so prg.cpp. So I'm going to create a file.prg.cpp. Then I'm going to include IO stream. We don't have .h in, in C++. I'll tell you later on why. OK? IO stream is input output stream. is like standard input output, but it's IO stream in C++. Then I'm going to say int main. And I'm going to say return 0. And in here, I'm going to say C out. C out is an object. We are doing object oriented, right? So C out is an object whose job is to print stuff on console. So it's console out, literally. OK? So it's an object. And to print it, you insert stuff to it. That's the insertion operator. So I insert, and I'm going to say testing, one, two, three. And I'm going to make it a little bigger. Is it visible now? Is it good back there? Are we OK? And then I'm going to say, and then insert a new line, end the line, OK? And finally, um, I have to mention to use namespace std. Why? Because the sky is high. I'll talk about it. Don't worry. In the lecture time, you're going to see here all about it. Now, what I'm going to do is to compile and run it. I want to compile and run it without debugging. So I'll click on debug. Start without debugging is what? Control F5. Try to learn how to use your shortcut keys. Control F5, and three years later, it compiles it, it runs it, 
and shows me an output that you need to see it with a microscope. So I'm going to go over here and go properties. I'm going to make it a little bigger. Click OK. Is that visible enough, hopefully? All right, now testing one, two, three. Visual Studio 2017 and 19 starting actually printing that message after you compile your code without debugging. Okay? When you compile and run your code without debugging, it shows that message at the end. It says, exit it with code zero. Anybody knows where that zero is coming from? It's the return zero. It's the return zero that I have at the end. So in here, if I say return and hit end and run it again, now it's going to return one, two, three, four, zero. Okay? Now, you have, all, you have to always look for that. If that's not the zero you return, z have you heard that they say no news is good news? Okay? Return zero means no news. Nothing special happened. Program ended when I wanted to end. Dun, da, da. If program ends prematurely for any reason, an exception is thrown. What is exception? We don't care. It's something bad. Okay? And it has a code. That code will be shown. If you don't see that zero, even if your program worked perfectly, something went wrong. You better fix it. Okay? Remember that. All right? All right. And tab. What is tab? When you are using tab in Visual C, plus plus, okay, or any other editor, it's not that it gets converted to spaces. When you say, I want the tab to be eight or four spaces, it's not that a tab is four spaces. It is that the tab position will be set on every four spaces. So if you are in column one and you insert a tab, it jumps to four. If you are on column two, it still jumps to four. If you are on column three, it jumps to four. If you go on column four, it jumps to eight. If you go on column five, it jumps to eight. Six jumps to eight. Seven jumps to eight. Eight jumps to 12. We understood how tab works? Are we okay with this? Now, what happens if you take your code and you use tab characters for indentation and the tab size over there is eight? It's going to go completely bananas. Your beautiful code that was intent indented properly is going to go... You don't know what's going to go where. Because of that, always do this. Follow me on Visual Studio, please. I'm going to close solution to make sure that I'm not in any specific mode in here. Okay, so this is the very first thing that you need to do. So after you open, open your Visual Studio, immediately do the tab thingy. Okay, now I'm going to tell you what the tab thingy is. Okay, so what do you do? Click on tools, do it now. Then click on options. Anybody needs more time to do this? Click on Tools, click on Options. Click on Tools, click on Options. Then, it's in Environment. Close that one and go Expand Text Editor and Expand All Languages. You will notice there is something called Tabs over there. So, Text Editor, Close Environment, Collapse environment, expand text editor, expand all languages, click on tabs. Tabs, options, close environment, expand text editor. Sorry, my finger was over there. Expand text editor, the fourth one, fifth one. Click uh, expand all languages. Click on tabs and wait for me. So, is everybody on tabs? You know, anybody want me to help you find tabs? You don't have tabs. I'm going to come to you. Okay, and you don't have it. Oh, you just opened Visual Studio. 
comes. That's it. That's it. Expand it. And taps. Yes. Yes. Yours is initializing Schmidtly dinghy. OK. Cancel. OK. I have no idea what is up. You can improve startup performance by auto hiding, collapsing. Oh, forget about that. Tools. Um, options. And use magic so it comes faster. Seriously? Shake the, OK, there you go. Cl collapse uh, environment. Click on that little triangle over there. OK, expand text editor. And expand all languages. Click on tabs. Yay! OK, now, when you click on tabs, you see lots of good stuff over there. Now, I want you to do this. Click on tabs. First, click on smart. We like smart stuff, OK? For tab size and indentation, put both three. And make sure you click on insert spaces. Keep tabs should be off. Then you click OK. When you do this at home, when no solution open, with no solution open, from now on, any solution that you cr create will adopt this. OK? But at school, because every single time it gets reset, you have to do it over and over. And yes. So, is that what you mean by do the tab? This is the tab. Oh, yeah, that's, this is the tab thingy. Yeah. OK. So, we did it. So, this is called the tab thingy. OK? Which means essentially <laughs> uh, removing tabs from your source code. OK? So, your code always remains organized regardless of from where to move it to where. Now, some text editors are so stupid that when you put something on and they see 20 spaces, they convert them to tabs. I don't know why, OK? I'm going to tell you how to fix those things, too. But anyways, you do this, then you click on, click on OK, and then we are good to go. Are we OK with this? Are we OK one? Are we OK two? Sold. Now, how do we take care of tabs in other applications? Some good ones I'll, I'm putting in here. So as you see over here, it says coding style, converting tab to spaces in VI. For all those geeks that I am not one of them that use VI to do their stuff, that's how you do it, OK? How to convert spaces to Visual Studio. When you go over there, probably it's Visual Studio 2012 or something. But it's the same. It didn't change. So uh, and code light, I just put another IDE. If that's another code, that is another ID. It's an open source ID, cross-platform on, every, on everything. I put it over there for you to see that every single thing comes with it. So if you don't know how to do it, who's your friend? Google. <laughs> Google it, OK? Google it and find out how to convert uh, tabs to spaces in Eclipse. How to con convert tabs to spaces in Xcode, OK? You're going to find out how. Do it. It's good for your health. All right? So that's that. Now, next thing. I want to, now, if you go to uh, OP244 repository, notes repository that I have over here, you'll see only September 3A is over there, right? Now I want to push what I just created for all you guys to see. What do I do? This is how I do it. First of all, I have a git ignore over here. See that git ignore? Git ignore is essentially exactly what it says. It tells the Git what to ignore. And if I open that beautiful file of mine, you'll see that the first one that I added up there is Visual Studio. I'm saying anything with extension SDF, we don't want it. Anything with user, we don't want it. SUO, Open SDF, ODB, all the files in debug directory, gone. IPCH, gone. X64, gone. Dot VS, gone. So I'm saying Ignore all these. Why? Because to move your project from one computer to another, you only need three types of file. Number one, your source code. Yeah, of course you need your source code. Okay? All the cppc.h files, data files, text files, anything that is involved with your project, you need those. And you need two more files. Those two files are called, with capital D, Yada, 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 VCX proj. And yada, yada, let me just, seriously? 
because it's not visible over here, I'm copying it over here. This is one, the one that has VCX proj, and the other one is the exact same thing, dot .filters. These are the two files that, so you carry these, you carry source code, you carry VCX proj and VCX proj filters, you're good to go. Put it on a memory stick, somewhere else, double click on that VCX proj, it opens your visual study exactly how you left it. Okay, everything's gonna be there. You don't need to carry other stuff. You don't want to carry your viruses from one computer to another. Don't carry your executables. That's why I did like that. When I actually want to add these things to Git, I told to Git to ignore all of them. So when in here, I first, to be able to add something to Git, you have to add it. So <laughs> that's a stupid thing to say, but hey, that's the command thing. So tortoise Git, add. You see, I'm not issuing any command line. If I wanted to do that, I had to now type Git, add, yada, yada, and I, I'm not doing that. So I'm going to say add. It's going to tell me what it adds, all the stuff that are going to be added. That SLN thingy, why did I include it and did not remove it? Because when we go to inheritance and talking about virtual functions, virtualities, abstract base class, and all this stuff, I want, I'm going to show you the progress of a project. So I'm going to start something I call an animal kingdom. And I create that one, and I keep expanding. So I want all the projects to be in one solution. Because of that, I'm leaving that solution thingy over there. You don't have it? No problem. If you leave it, OK. That's something that you can carry to. It adds a little bit more history to your Visual Studio, which means which window was open, where the cursor was standing, what is things like that. But anyways, so I'll click over here. Now everything is added, but it's added. It's not still saved in my repository. To save in the repository, to make the repository track it, it's called commit. Okay, so when I commit this beautiful thing now, as you see that thing from and. Commit needs a comment. I have to tell you what, tell what it is. So I'm going to say prog uh, testing one, two, three program. I'm telling what I am committing. Now I'm going to say commit. It just committed to my laptop on the desk. Right in here. If I want it to send, if I want to send it to GitHub so you guys can see it too, I have to sync GitHub repository by my, with mine. And that's a push command. So now I'm going to click push. If that repository does not have any changes in it, push is going to be successful. Otherwise, it's going to tell me, hey, there are things over there that you didn't get yet. Then you have to first do a pull, get those changes, and then do a push. So everything is synced. So you click OK. And three years later, comes up. Great success. Now take a look at the repositories. Refresh your browser. It's right in there, correct? Did you install Tortoise Git when I told you? So your My Apps Tortoise Git must be installed. Everybody, what? My dear, I just asked you if you have installed it, how to use it. I'll tell you. Don't worry. Deep breath. I'll tell you how to do it. Okay? So don't worry about. It. So you installed Tortoise Git? We are attempting to communicate with apps anywhere on your device. Got it. Did you know? Oh, I think it's installed. That's that's Tortoise Git. Close them. Tortoise Git. Okay. Again. Not again. I forgot to mention. It's my bad. Tortoise Git is an additional feature to your Windows Explorer. It's a shell. No program will run. It just adds something to your Windows, Windows Explorer. So nothing's going to run. It sits behind the scene and lets you, as you saw, what I'm doing right now. Did I run any Git? No, I right-clicked on something and I selected the menu. Wait for me. Again, deep breath. We're going to go there. Are we okay down to here now? Okay, so everybody clicked on that launch thingy on their thing, on their tortoise Git. Okay, now I want you to do this. Now, go to the repository and follow me on this, please. What's the time? Oh, we have time. Okay. 
So go over there. It says clone or download. Expand that. Mine says clone with SSH. Yours says clone with HTTPS. Let it be HTTPS. You don't have an option because you're not logged in. Just click on this little icon over here at right to copy this URL into clip clipboard. Just do that. Click on it, nothing happens. When you click on it, nothing happens. Just click, okay? Everybody clicked? Have we clicked? Are we clicked? We are? Okay, now, now open up your Windows Explorer. Go to drive T D that it says temp. Open it. Open drive D. Okay? All right? And right click anywhere in drive D. And you see the option of git clone, correct? Click on it. Automatically, what you have copied will be pasted in the URL. You're going to see there's a blue thing in the URL. You see that? Click on OK and see what happens. Give me a second. Three years? I know, that's OK, because everybody's suddenly getting what what happened. Oh, here's done. It's good success. Great success. OK, done, done, done. Beautiful. Are we OK? What was that? <laughs> OK. Are we OK? OK, now go to that thing. Now, I'm not going to put it over there. I'm going to put it on Drive C or uh, in Documents. Where's my document? Documents. And I'm going to go in Temp. Where's my Temp? Documents. Seneca, Seneca, Seneca. Temp. Oh, come on. Did I move anything? Did I, temp. Now I'm going to right click over here and do the exact same thing. And I'm going to say OK. And I have it over here too. So that's, wow, this is taking a long time. Oh, I didn't. Arsenica. Oh, abort, abort, abort. It was the last copy that I have done was from Dev. And Dev is the development. A repository for the professors to develop your course stuff. So that's like a ginormous thing with 95,000 things in it. We don't want it. I just aborted. I'm going to delete it later on. Anyways, anything that you don't need, just delete. Easy. No problem. Okay? So, um, anyways, if I did that, I would have had, so if I just click over here, I do it, exactly what's going to happen is, 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 where is my OP244? Is this, right? So you have this thing right on your local computer, correct? Double click on VCX Proj. Close it. Oh, go to notes. OP244, yada yada notes. Oh, why did you close it? Yeah. No, no, no. On, the, on Windows Explorer, it says OP244 NABC notes. Open it. Go to September 03. Not A, C. You are section C. Zero two. Double click on VCX Proj. The one that starts with VCX Proj. And let it open. Oh, it opens with 2017. <laughs> I have to change. I have to service call, have service call for this. So, okay, let me just write this. Okay. Now everybody close Visual Studio. <laughs> right click and say open with Visual Studio uh, 2019. So uh, fix. VCX Proj, um, what do they call it? Uh, VCX Proj assignment. Okay, I have to open a service call so they fix that. So, anyways, right, uh, close the Visual Studio that got open with that thing, and let me come to it. No, don't open it. Is it Visual Studio 17? Close it. Close it, please. Close. Close. Thank you. Okay, now give me two seconds. I want to check something. Yes, okay, so what you do, I wish I could show you, but let me see if I can do it over here. So right click, right click on the VCX Proj, then go open with and select 2000 uh, Visual Studio 2000, 2019. If you do 17, it's not, so right click, yes. No, all the things that I mentioned, no, 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 didn't I, did you, didn't you clone it? No, so you should have cloned it. Should 
this, copy, go here, drive D, right click, clone, OK, tell, close, open this one, open this one, right click, open with, you don't have a in 2019 on this computer. Huh, you don't have 2019 on this computer. This computer is bad, use something else. The, oh, did you install, did you go to my apps and install 2019 as I mentioned? You installed 2017 by mistake. VS, uh, Visual Studio, not VS, Visual. 2019 is what you need to install, and then you can do it, okay? So now you have it, okay? All right, so now what I'm going to do is, now I'm going to show you how to bring new information into it, okay? So I'm going to add one thing here, so I'm going <coughs> to... I'm going to add one file in here, so I'm going to paste this file. I'm going to add this file to our skit add, and I'm going to call it debugging, debugging, commit, push. Okay, now this is what I want you to do. Go back to Windows Explorer, go one direct, go two directories up until you see OOP244 NABC notes. Right click on that and tortoise git and pull. You can see it on the menu. So go back, right click on it, tortoise git and pull. T-U-L-L -L up up at very top. Click and then OK. This means I want you to sync my repository to the one on GitHub. Therefore, it brings anything that I just added. And if you go back in, you will see one file is added to it. Now click OK. Close. Take a look at your, take a look at that. You see, it's added now. OK? That's, that's what you need to do at home too. Have these notes cloned. And every single time that I'm having a new lecture, you simply pull the changes and you're done. OK? You simply pull the changes and you're done. You don't have to re, because lots of students, for some reason, they go over there, they download zip. And every single time, they are copying the whole thing. And then delete that, copy the whole thing. And then copy, just don't do that. Just get what is added, and you're done. OK? What was the purpose of this? I want to show you how debugging is done. How much time do I have? 14 minutes. That's good. If I don't finish this lecture, I don't want you to follow me with, if you can follow me, good. If you couldn't follow me, no problem. Do it at home, see the video and look, do it at home, okay? How do we do debugging with Visual Studio? Okay, now, with this, follow me if you can. So first I'm gonna open up that uh, solution as you did, so I'll right click. Open with Visual Studio 2019. Wait for three years. It opens it. Sorry, I have to sit. This podium is short. All right. So I will click on prog.prg.cpp, right click, and then remove. Then it tells me, do you want to delete it? I'm going to say no, just remove. So it's going to remove it from this solution. The file is still on a hard drive. Now I'm going to add a new thing. So I'm going to right click to this on the source files and I'm going to say add existing item. What is the existing item? The one that says W1 in lab. This is the one that you got to do in lab with it. But I put some bugs in it and I want to fix it. Okay? So I'm going to click add. Now it's added to my solution. If I do control F5 to run it, three years later, it will compile, compile and run the program. There you go. So that is the program. Now, 
if you look at it, you will see that if you run it, you will see that the lines drawn are a little too long. They're not supposed to be like that. Also, the cursor over here is blinking right in front of the prompt. I don't like that. It has to be one space between the two. So I want to fix these. And I want to find out how to find these, how to trace my code, walk through my code using Visual Studio, and do this. I don't want to do it by walking through myself, because this is, let's say, the source code for Google Chrome. It's a big thing. I just found a mistake. I want to just go find that mistake. So you don't want to browse through the whole thing, OK? If you have written the code, you can guess approximately where the problem might arise, OK? Because I have written the code, I know I have written a function called line that draws that line, OK? So I have to see how it is working. For that, first of all, how the program works, it sets, it's a statistical, it, it gets statistics and draw, draws bars for it. So set the number of samples. I'm going to set the number, number of samples, let's say, to three. Then it says enter the samples. So I enter the samples, whatever I want to enter, and it gets those values. Then I'm going to say draw a graph for it. It draws a graph for it. And as you see, even for the graph, the line is two characters long, longer than it's supposed to be. So that's where my bug is. Now I have to fix it. How do I fix it? First, let me exit the program. All right, now the next thing I'm going to do over here will be this. I'm going to open up my source code. Is it still recording? Yes, it's recording. I'm going to open up my source code, and I'm going to go to the line function. I see the prototype is here, right? I right click on the prototype, and I'm going to say go to definition. It jumps to the definition of the function. So now I am in the function. I want to get into that function and browse it and see how it works. So I'll bring the mouse right outside of Visual Studio, right beside the line that li right beside the code where line begins and click it. That adds a breakpoint or what I call a stop sign. Now if I run my program using debugging, it's going to execute and pop, stop right at that point. So what do I do? How do I run with debugging? I'm going to go to debug, and I see start debugging is F5. So I'll do that. I press F5. It runs and stops right over there. If you do that, you're going to see there are 50 windows are going to open, like performances, this and that. Close all the things that you don't want to see and make sure you have enough sight to see your code. Then make sure you see your code and your output of the code so you can actually trace through. So at left side, I have Visual Studio. At right side, I have the output. That's one of the beautiful things that I love about Visual Studio. I couldn't do that with Eclipse. Otherwise, I would have taught this with Eclipse. OK? Now, Eclipse actually creates a, an internal window with the output. It's not the console. OK? But anyways, so now I'm going to go. Now, I want to step over this line and see how it executes. How do I step over? That's literally what it does. Step over. So I'm going to go to debug. Step over means, and it's F10. It means run this line as whole. If it's a function, it's not going to go inside the function and walk through the function. It's going to run it as whole. So I'm going to press F10, and voila, it printed one plus sign at the top. Now it's going to be the for loop, right? So I'm going to press F10 again, and it draws the for loop for me. OK? It's a little too long, I know, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I can make it smaller. The screen is, uh, so uh, I'm going to bring it uh, on 20 and see if it fits. Yeah, I think it's good. All right. So that's that. Now I'm going to do F10. And it prints a dot at, oh, I printed F10, and what did I print? OK, I'm going to run it again. Stop. How to stop? You click over here. There's a stop sign over here. One of these things has a stop sign in it. There you go. That stops debugging. OK, now I'm going to press F5 again, and it starts from the beginning again. So I'm going to go F5. I press something and it went where it's not supposed to. So F10 goes over here and goes over here, prints that. Now F10 again. 
to print C out. Now it says if label is not null, it is not null, it's a message. It comes here and calls a function called go back. What does go back do? It moves the cursor back halfway through. How does it do it? I don't know. If you want to know, you want to go inside that function. You don't want to jump over it. That's why you press F11. F11 is step into. So it essentially steps into the function and starts going through that. And now I see it's a simple for loop that prints backspace, backslash B. Backslash B was backspace, right? So it essentially executes that and brings the, back, uh, uh, the, the cursor to back. Then it goes out, come back over here, and prints the label exactly where the cursor was left. And then it goes to new line. So every single thing that it's doing, I can walk through. All right? Now, let's come back up. Now that line 75 was executed, while not done, switch to the output of the menu. I want to see how the menu works. I press F11. It goes inside menu, and it prints a line of, one, uh, a line of 28 characters. Oh. I pressed F10, but it went inside the function anyway. Why? Because there's a stop sign in there. Doesn't matter. I want to get out of the function. I know how the function works. I want it. I don't want to go through the whole thing. You want to step out of the function. So you go over here, you go step out. That is Shift 11. Shift 11 means run the whole function and get out. Shift 11 runs the whole function and gets out. Comes back here, prints number of samples, and then Line, oh, wait a minute. This is the place that the two extras are printed, right? Okay, so my line is printing two extra characters that I don't want to. How do I fix that? How do I make this not to print two extra characters? It's a for loop, people. How do I make this for loop? Let me make it a little smaller. How do I make this for loop to print two less number of dashes? N minus 2, for heaven's sake. Thank you, whoever said that. N minus 2. Right? Correct? Now, I'm going to continue my debugging. I'm going to press F10. Because I changed the code, it tries to recompile and go back to the same place. If it can do it, it will. If it cannot, then you have to restart from the beginning. But apparently it did. So I'm going to do Shift-11 again to run the whole thing, and voila, it's fixed. So now I know it's fixed. I go to the next one, and let's bring this down. Let's continue. Enter the sample. Goes over here. Prints this, prints that, prints the prompt. Now it's going to bring the cursor back right over here, correct? And when it does that, the cursor comes a little too far back, correct? So that's a problem too. Let's go to the go back. So I'm going to right click over here and say go to definition. How do I make thing to go back one less? Either n minus one or remove that assignment, correct? Instead of less than or equal, I can make it less than, correct? So all I need to do over here is to remove that and continue my debugging. So I'm going to press F10 again, attempts to recompile, so it's fine. Where is it? Oh, it's actually waiting for me. Okay, so in here I'm going to say set samples, I hit enter. And goes back up, probably is going to give me an error message. Oh, enter a number of things av uh, available. It's going to get an integer. So I'm going to print three and hit enter. So it comes down, goes back up, not done. The menu want to happen. Let's see if the menu is fixed now. Oh, it went into line again. I'll remove that stop sign because I don't need it anymore. And I'll press shift 11, shift 11, and Again, Shift-11 to write the menu as whole, and voila, it's fixed. Now I can press F5 to continue the whole program. 
But there is one thing that you have to remember. There is one thing you have to remember. Because it's, deep, it's running without debugging, if you don't tell it when the program ends, it completely shuts down the window. If you want the window to remain open when you are doing the debugging, you have to go to your main and add a stop sign at the end of your main. Otherwise, it's going to run and close the window quickly. So I'll put it over there and say right before returning to operating system, stop. Now I can actually press over here, for example, enter samples. Sorry, F5 again. Now I'm going to enter 20, 30, and 40. And press 3 to show the messages. To, and that's done. Now I'll press 0, hit enter. And now it stops right over here. Everything is good. I'll stop the debugging and I'm done. OK? Now, this you need to be able to do very comfortably. Because, truth be told, when you are going to get hired as a programmer, 80% of the time, this is your job. You got to fix the problems. OK? You write the program once, you maintain it the rest of your life. OK? That's the thing. You've got to make sure to be able to use this thing properly. And when you use this, it's not only that you're using Visual Studio. It's the same in all IDEs. In this, you press F10. F10. In some other thing, you press F7. In the other one, you do control this. So the idea is the same. You just need to know how to deal with it. Another thing that I uh, forgot to mention is that when you are actually running this as debugging, let me just put something somewhere. Let's say I want to check to see how uh, um, get int works or print graph works. So if I put a stop sign right over here and run it, and I'll do one, three, then I'm going to go two, 40, 50, and 60. Now I'm going to say print graph, and it's going to stop right over there. You can bring the mouse on every single variable, and it's going to tell you what the content of the variable is. So it tells you max is 65. It's going to tell you that, I don't know, i has garbage in it, or it's going to tell you samples has a 40 in it, or number of samples is 3. So you can simply bring the mouse, hover it over variables. It tells you what the content of the variable is. Very easy to debug. Yes, sir. Or debugging it. Yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, while you're running it. Otherwise, how can it say what it is? So while you're debugging, you hover the mouse over any variable, any local. I cannot bring the variable in here and tell you what its bar length is because I'm out of that scope. It can only tell me. So it still follows the logics of programming. So if I am in this function, only these stuff are, vari of, are visible. Or if I have something, a global variable or something. You cannot see what is I in here, because it has nothing to do with that, right? Keep that in mind. That's it. That was debugging with Visual Studio. The next day you're coming in, we're going to have a quiz, and I did not mention it to the other one. on. On the first week, so essentially if you go to, we have to go because the other class is waiting at the door. Uh, so if you go to subject timeline, we're going to have welcome to object oriented, object terminology, modular programming. These three things we have a quiz on. Okay? Study it. I'll see you soon. Ciao. Bye bye. Oh, any questions? Oh, yes, everything's going to go up. Uh, uh, the video is going to go up there. Uh, let, give me two seconds. Let me stop the recording. Do you mind if I stop everything and pack stuff so the other teacher doesn't and then come to you? Okay, give me two seconds. Sorry about that.